Howdy everybody, welcome to the Indie Scientology Podcast. I'm your host Andy Nolch, the Space Cowboy, and isn't it lovely to be here listening to the Strassi Wassi? This is a podcast that has everything to do with the interesting world of Scientology. Yes, that funky religion you might have heard about. If you don't know what Scientology is, then I recommend listening to the first few podcasts. I explain basic things about Scientology in a basic, simple way. It's quite a deep and thorough and complex subject. And uh, to be honest, uh, these interviews aren't really for people who are new to Scientology because they probably won't know what I'm talking about. Today's guest interview is with Janice Gilham Grady. She is like Scientology royalty. Very exciting. She spent a lot of time, with personal time, with L1 Hubbard. She was his uh, personal messenger. So it's a, she's a good person to listen to. How did you like the last podcast with Jonathan Burke, part three? I, uh, I've heard some good feedback from it. I think it's good that uh, Sire's out there liking it just as much as I am. Ooh. It's now time to go down that rabbit hole into the world of Scientology. Up is down, down is up. Left is right, right is left. What you thought was impossible is possible. Welcome to the show on this 31st of October, 2017. Halloween time. Ooh, trick or treat. Well, I got a little uh, treat here for you, and it's an interesting Facebook post. It's by Tundi Aroli. I would love to know how that's actually pronounced, because um, I <laughs> it would be really funky, and we really would be in an interesting world if I actually uh, pronounced that name correctly. Anyway, this is the, the good Facebook post. This is the only thing that matters on Earth, the 10 talents. Number one, Total Recall. Number two, by the way, Total Recall is such a good movie. I love it. I love it. And I love how it's from 1990. It just takes you back to 19, even though it wasn't really around then. But it's just, whoa. Check out Total Recall, the movie. Okay. That was, that, that one got distracted. Okay. I got distracted. Okay. Number two, extrasensory perception. Number three, telekinesis. Number four, teleportation. Oh, by the way, about Total Recall as well. Um, apparently, one of the writers of that is a Sio or something. He's a Scientologist. Anyway, sorry, I'm I'm going to start it again because I'm just not doing this post enough credit because I'm just going off on the Total Recall thing. Okay, so number one was Total Recall. Number two was Extrasensory Perception. Number three was Telekinesis. Number four was Teleportation. Number five, Translation. And 6 to 10 is eternal life. This is our human birthright. It is an insult to God to pee away what he created for us. But most people do it without blinking. Total recall is a foundation of spiritual power. Only when you have unrestricted access to all of your memories are you your true self. The reason why you are only about 10% conscious is because there are memories on your mind that your mind does not want you to consciously recall. When you confront them, you get that part of the disabled part of your mind back into conscious control again. Wow. Yeah, I guess that's the whole, I feel like, yeah, that's a lot to do with the, with Scientology. The whole point of it is just to get your recall back and work out who the hell you you were in your past life instead of being in some sort of f- fog of dreamlike bizarreness of like who the hell am I and, and where the hell what, who, yeah, who have I been what's going on it's just like finding out who you are knowing it's exactly who you are knowing what you've done it's like beating the amnesia yeah 
And you can do that with uh, Scientology auditing, which is pretty cool. Okay, we've got, we got an independent Scientology win of the week. It's by Kerry Burke. What the briefing course did for me. It's like Ron personally, by the way, completing the briefing course is a pretty damn big thing and I would love to do it. This is, this is a really big, you know, this is a really big completion of a course. Uh, it's uh, Yeah, it's a big thing. Yeah, big wins from this. Okay. It's like Ron personally led me up a mountain path, pointing out things he felt were important along the way. But when we finally made it to the mountain's peak, I saw so, so much more on my own, having been given his viewpoint. I recommend the briefing course to everyone. The materials are available, but with one caution. Do the materials, most especially including the taped lectures, for the real gems of understanding are buried there in date order, per the check sheet. That way you understand the genus of the subjects of the subject and can experience Ron's journey up that mountain and why the technology evolved the way it did and find yourself so much smarter even without having had a lot of personal in the chair case gain yet and free to see and evaluate existence for yourself. Senior datum. The proof of anything like a technology is whether or not it works. Does it change conditions? Are beings freed, more courageous, happier, anxious to help others? Scientology, per LRH, works like nothing else. And that's why Ron created Class 12, to ensure that if everything one day went to hell in a handbasket, there would be beings around who could recreate the bridge from memory. Yeah, wow. Pretty cool, and that's uh, yeah, it's that's good. I was just thinking, should this segment be called uh, "Independent Scientology Success Story of the Week" instead of "Win of the Week"? Because sometimes it's it's sort of talking about the anyway. I've got to sort that out. Now, if you want to try independent Scientology, just Google it. Pretty much. There's different organizations. There's Ron's Org. There's uh, the Advanced Organization of the Great Plains in America where he travels around in a RV. There's, uh, what is there? There's Milestone 2 in the Australia area. And there's, yeah, there's lots of, and there's, you know, lots of uh, private audi auditors. There's the Association of Professional Independent Scientologists. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a yellow book, yellow pages of, of auditors, and you find someone there is standard. And Anyway, there's also a, a, another podcast besides this one uh, about Scientology, and it's called Scientology Outside the Church. It's uh, by Jonathan Burke, and he recently, I think, has posted some old episodes of the podcast that uh, that hadn't been posted before. Um, on the app that I could receive the podcast from. So now you can receive them. And um, so if you want to hear some more interesting interviews about Scientology, check out the uh, podcast Scientology Outside the Church. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's a bit more, I think it's a bit more tech related, the podcast. It's a bit more an auditor interviewing or interviewing an auditor. I think... The indie, the indie Scientology podcast is a bit more on the whole, uh, the the admin side of things because it it really kind of is. There's two sides to life. There's the admin side, and then there's the, the tech side, and they're both huge areas. Um, this yeah, you need, and I think you need to you really need to master both because there's just so much going on. Like, you can be an auditor that really knows the Scientology tech, but then doesn't really know about admin and doesn't really know about corrupt governments and how the world works and stuff. And I don't think they'll be as good as auditing without knowing that sort of stuff. So we, it's like, a, a, I think it's a balance of both sides, like the left and the right side of the bridge, the, ad, the bridge of the admin and the um, tech side. 
Yeah, it's like yeah, you, I think you got to do you got to do both, but to be honest, you got to specialize in something. So if someone's going to specialize in auditing, you know auditing a bit more. Or if you're going to be running an org, you're going to be an admin sort of guy and an executive director. You're going to start your own mission. You got to be a bit more aware of the admin side of things. But you got to be an expert in both. And that can be done, just takes time. All right. It's that time. It's that time for a Scientology joke. Get ready, get excited. You're going to love this one. This one, oh, this one's looking good. My theta abilities is telling me this is going to be a very good joke. Okay. A Scientologist met a fairy who said she would grant her one wish. I want to live forever, said the Scientologist. Uh, sorry, already, I'm just thinking the Scientologist would, wouldn't say something like that because the Scientologist would say... I know I already live forever. Anyway, but let's just say for joke purposes. I'll start that again. A Scientologist met a fairy who said she would grant her one wish. I want to live forever, said the Scientologist. Sorry, said the fairy. I can't grant wishes like that. Fine, said the Scientologist. I want to live until Congress gets its head out of its ass. Crafty bastard, said the fairy. Yeah, that was all right. See, my well, theta abilities was kind of right on that one. It kind of was funny. It wasn't like I was going to laugh out loud, but at least I think that that classifies as a joke, whereas some of these other ones were pretty bad, really, in this joke book. They weren't even classified as a joke, really. All right, it's now time for the guest interview with uh, Janice Gilham Grady. The, uh, she was born in Australia, by the way, uh, but moved to St. Hill when she was about 10 years old and then was caught up in the whole Sea Org thing and now lives in Las Vegas, so she's got an American accent. Anyway, it's a good interview. We discuss interesting things. We discuss uh, the final years of L. Ron Hubbard's life in that whole Californian desert area, what was sort of going on. It's good insights. Um, you're going to like it. So let's dig into this. Let's hear some talk about the McDonald's of religions, Scientology. Today's guest interview is with Janice Gilhan Grady. She is what you could call Scientology royalty. Her parents were old-timer Australian sires, Peter and Yvonne Gilham. Janice has spent time at St. Hill and on the Apollo, where she joined the Sea Org as a kid. And she was out in a desert in California during the final years of LIH's life. She was one of the original Commodore messengers, which meant she got to spend a lot of time personally, personally with L. Ron Hubbard, passing on messages for him. She left the Sea Org around 1990 and has written a book titled Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization. And I've got her here for the podcast. Are you there, Janice? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Andy. Hey, it's great to have you. I uh, I read the book and I liked it. Good. You're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was good. Well, it would kind of be a little bit awkward if I um had to talk to you about a book that I wouldn't personally recommend because uh, I guess I'd have to be fake or something. And I think that would be a bit weird. So, because I think when I saw the title of it, I thought, oh, maybe this is a Scientology hater and they 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 just attack the subject and they ignore any of the good sides. Um, but it wasn't like that. It was, um, a lot of information or like historical information. Like you've even got a map of the, the Apollo ship in the book and lots of good photos. And it's, it's just a good book. Good. I'm glad you like it. That was what I intended. I didn't want to opinionate it. I wanted everyone to just read the facts and form their own opinion. Yeah, and I think I, I like it how you, you're doing three books because um, when I first uh, started reading it, I thought that this was going to be one whole story, like well, one book basically. And then because you, you go into so much detail, then I was like, hold on a second, you know, she's not going to have enough time to to talk about <laughs> talk about the eighties. So obviously this is going to yeah this is going to be a series, and then it says book one on it. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it's good because. 
um, if you did do it in one book, then you'd have to skim over things. And this is, it's kind of like um, with this podcast in that the interviews t- tend to be long because sometimes they just have to be that way. Otherwise, you know, you can't just brush over these sub these things we're talking about, you know? Right. And that, that's how I felt when I was writing it. I was told, oh, you should just do one book. And these were other authors telling me this. And I was like, I just couldn't do that because it just cuts so much meat out of the story. So that's when I said, all right, it's three. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm really looking forward to the, um, this, the next one. And, and then particularly the one uh, after that, part three, um, it's, yeah, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. I mean, it, it sort of takes you back for people who weren't around in the sixties and on the ship and who weren't around in the seventies. It sort of, it allows you to experience, um, being, being back in those times, you know? Right, right. Yeah, like like yeah. little things. Like I remember you, you mentioned how the, on the ship people would get sick from some food poisoning or something. Like little personal things of what it would really be like to be uh, in the Sea Org back then. Right, right. Well, yeah, even Steve Kaneen had said to me, leave in the brick barbecue when I was telling the story about when we were in Australia as kids and what our backyard was like and – having other public come over and we'd have a barbecue and he was like oh i love it just leave that part in there giving all that description yes yeah it 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 actually really reminded me of um my parents uh generation because they're like the same age as you and uh it reminded yeah it reminded me of them because they were they were brought up uh you know like in the kew area of melbourne like the nice suburban area of melbourne and it was just uh you know, you going to those sort of details at school and, and swimming classes, it was very, uh, you know, a very, I guess, maybe a baby boomer um, experience, a childhood experience. Until, right. until, of course, you went over to England and St. Hill and things started to get real funky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and let me see what I want to ask you about. Oh, so your parents ran a PE centre in Melbourne. Um, yes. And that was at their home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we were in uh, Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah, and it was on the main road, wasn't it? Yeah, it was on um, Riversdale Road. Riversdale Road. Yes, yeah. and then we then we moved out to Camberwell, and there's that junction out there, and uh, that's where we moved it to was the junction. Oh, so did, but, but, and and you didn't live in the junction, did you? No, we lived over on Kingsley Street. Well, wow. and at the junction, just out of curiosity, because I know these areas, I, I work at on homes that you probably lived in, in Melbourne. You know what I mean, like those type of homes and that. Um, what, what part of the junction? Oh, you know, coming up from Hawthorne, I remember getting off at the junction and going one street over, but then on the other side was the Golden Bowl, where we used to trampoline and they had bowling alleys. Okay. And all sorts of what stuff. What about that, that building that's a snooker it's a snooker hall now, but it's like a triangle shaped building, old fashioned. It would have been there back when you were there. Yeah, it was probably around that, that area. That area, yeah, wow. Yeah. 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 Good lo a good location for a PE centre, like that's just gold. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um what about what sort of numbers were people in the course room back then? Um, well, not huge or anything, but I remember probably around 30 or 40 people, which was a good size for those days. Yeah, I, I heard that the uh, the Melbourne uh, staff, before it got shut down and everything by the government, um, they were they were making a good living and they were getting like 20 new people on the PE course every week, which is really good. Like it's a way an org should be running, you know. Right. Well, that was what, in the 70s? No, no, no. That this, this was in the 60s. Oh, in the 60s, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. the, the Hazzy, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty good because nowadays at, at the Ideal Org, um, you know, they're probably getting like two or something, maybe three or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, just out of curiosity, you haven't checked out any of these Ideal Orgs or anything? No, I mean, you know, <laughs> these Ideal Orgs are so off policy, it's not even funny. Because you're supposed to just start from like one little room and you build up. And as you expand, you get bigger spaces. You don't get bigger spaces and try and fill it. You fill what you have. 
Yeah, it's total. It's our gradients. It's, it's just. It's. It doesn't. It's silly. It's. Um. Do you know what it kind of reminds me of? Kind of reminds me of like a a rich private school kid, and his daddy gives him like a bunch of money to start a business, and. Um, because the, the, the kid didn't learn about how to start a business the normal way where you progress and grow, um, right. the, the kid just spends money on some expensive building and it just fails. This sort of stuff happens in real life. And this is basically what's happened with um, Miscavige uh, running the Church of Scientology. He's, he's just like sort of inherited this, this, this wealth of people who are willing to actually donate and then they build these ideologues and it's kind of our gradient. Right, and the ideologues really have nothing to do with the delivery of Scientology. You can deliver Scientology anywhere, you know, in the backyard, in a break room somewhere, you know, in a closet. Mm. You don't have to have a big, huge, beautiful building to deliver Scientology. That was never a thought in the beginning days. I know. So many things are wrong with it, especially um, how they've moved some of them out of the center of the city. Like the Melbourne Org was in a perfect location it was just gold and then now it's like out in the suburbs so it's it's just not not that good um what was i going to say uh so with your last name it'll be interesting i want to ask you about your last name i mean so um you uh you married obviously and then you got the name grady yes and why do scientologists um have these hyphen names all the time well they don't I, I did it because so many people knew me from my maiden name. I hyphenated when I got married so that people wouldn't forget who, that I was a Gillum. Yeah, but, but, but I've noticed, I've noticed a, a, a lot of um, Scientologists see on PC folders these, you know, names like Smith Levin and, and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? These connected names? That, that's an English thing. Oh, really? Where in England, yeah. In England, you're hyphenated when you got married. I was very English, so when I when I got married, it was you know it had been tradition, and also my mother had been that way, and her parents had been that way. Did you get married while you were in the Sea Org? Yes. And then um, did you and your husband both leave? Yeah, we were in the Sea Org. Uh, he was in eleven years. We were married eleven years in the Sea Org before we left. Oh wow! Um, so we left together after eleven years, uh, and, and we're said- still together. Yeah, and, and um, you're not an independent Scientologist, are you? No. Uh, are, you a, are you a church? You're not a church member, obviously. No. No? no? Um, have, you got any, have you been attacked by, the, um, by this book? No. This book? Not, not that I've seen or heard. They're probably too they've busy. Left me, they've left me alone. Yeah, they're too busy with, <laughs> with Leah Remini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I mean, I think, I think on their point of view, I think you could call that a train wreck cycle. They, I don't think they're getting much success on that at all. No. Um, so, um, on on the, the yeah, on in your book, you had some pictures of the the Apollo ship, uh, and on there, it was really cool to see what each room, uh, you know, like you labelled each room and what they were doing and stuff. I couldn't find a room that said the course room. I didn't have any pictures of the course room. But, but as in with the whole... with the map though, as in uh, you, like where you broke it down, like oh, do you know what I mean? I would have said uh, hold two. Hold two, okay. Hold two. I've got the book right here. Um... Let's have a look. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't put it in there, do I? Well, well, it says, it says, um, you're right. You know what? It says LRH car storage. Well, underneath that is where the course rooms were. Okay. So, and, and how many students could you fit in these rooms? Oh, was it one room or? It was one big hold. You know, it used to be a hold for cattle. And so it went from one side of the ship to the other side. Oh, and that was a that was the whole course room. Yeah, yeah, it was a whole course room. It, no matter what course you were on, all the crew went down there. And then when we had students from the orgs come in, they were down in the same course room with the crew. So was that like enough to like kick a football in? It was like a proper. It was the length of the ship, sort of. No, no, not the length. The the wideness. The width, of the ship, widest the width. Of the ship. Yeah. Yeah, it was the width of the ship, and then 
it was probably 40, 50 feet uh, long. And so you could put a lot of students in there. Our, our cadet school was in there, and that was kind of curtained off in the corner. And then everybody, no matter what course they were on, were in the rest of the space. And then doing drills, you are over on the side. Wow. And what about, I didn't notice many um, rooms that look like auditing rooms. No, we had cabins, and so where everybody lived in the cabins, an auditor was assigned to a cabin, and they would audit in that cabin. Ah, that's so, what I'm, yeah, double use of the room. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I'm saying. You don't need a big, huge, ideal org building to audit in. We had little cabins, you know, that had bunk beds in it, and then it had a small space, and maybe four foot by six foot, and you put a card table in there and two chairs, and they audited yeah, and, and they'll never fill the ideal orgs unless they have the mission network set up to fill them up. You know, I mean, that, that, yes. that's the big missing thing. And, and so it's like it really should have started with ideal missions. It should have been a hardcore mission project to just pump missions everywhere and then ideal orgs. Um, right. Where's, where's my questions? Hold on a second. Now, um... Uh, I've got an interesting question about some old timers in Melbourne. Did you ever know the Mead Moors? Yes, Roger and Helen. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're the ones that created the pancake parlor, right? Yes, and I actually I tell the story of Helen Meadmore and the bird cake, the bird Avery. Yes, yeah, to, in the book, yeah, yeah, with the budgies. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Um. So they um they're not really involved with Scientology anymore or something. I think they did it last in the eighties. Is that what you've do you know much about them? Yeah, I saw Helen when I was down there in seventy nine eighty. That was the last time I saw her. Okay, yeah. Um, the, just for people who are listening, uh, the Pancake Parlor is like this restaurant chain of uh, that serves a lot of pancakes with food, and it's got a bit of an Alice in Wonderland theme to it, and it's uh, really cool. Like you can tell it's been made by Sires, uh, and it's a real successful, I think, restaurant. Um. Uh, what what was uh, Captain Bill like? Captain Bill was a good guy. He definitely cared for his crew. Uh, he knew his navigation. Um, he he had some quirky side to him, but he, you know, I liked him. I got along well with him. He was a genuine guy. Yeah. Um, what what was interesting in the book was when um you started to talk about how Captain Bill was hunting down psychiatrists in LA. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty cool. See, hold, this, is, this is where I'm talking about where the historical information it was in the book that was really important because um, have you read Captain Bill's debrief? I've bits and pieces of it. Yeah, well, I remember when I first uh, read that, I mean, my jaw was dropping like as in, is this really true? And then the more and more I've looked into stuff that Captain Bill says and in that debrief, the more I've been like, shit, this, this is really is the truth. And then, you, you know, I'm, I'm reading your book and you mention how he was over there chasing down psychiatrists or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I remember how he's mentioning that in the debrief. And it's just like, it's good to have data come together and, and validate things. And I think that's what, you, what right. your book does. You, you go, oh, I've heard someone mention that in their biography and that, and it, pieces all together so you can sort of you can trust you know right yeah right because all big confusion everyone's stories and it's just all like a big mess you know so it's really right. good to be able to work out what the truth is right and then you've got the the scientologists the official church of scientology saying that didn't happen or those people are liars well no they're not those things did happen it's it, yeah, it's it's just amazing, and also when you talk a bit about the um, attacks on uh, Scientology by governments and stuff, like you have a little bit of like sort of confidential geo data in there, and uh, yeah, it's it's super interesting. Uh, I could, it's just interesting seeing how it was just so attacked. Right. Well, book two, I even got I've got more geo stuff showing a further of us being tracked throughout the Mediterranean and the Caribbean by the U.S. government. And yeah. so I, I cover that as well, more in book two. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's amazing. The, the truth is amazing. Um, 
with do you know what I, I find interesting about the Captain Bill thing hunting down psychiatrists in LA as well who are PDHing people? Um, I find it interesting that it seems like LRH found out about this and didn't punish him. No. Is that right? No. He didn't punish him. Uh, you know, uh, Captain Bill did have to do conditions when he came back, but it wasn't a big deal. And he was put on his navigator because that is a job he can do. And Hubbard used to say about Bill, he was like a Div 6 man. You put him out there, he runs wild, and he'll drive all sorts of people in. And every now and again, you got to pull him back in and then, you know, let him back out slowly. <laughs> yeah, but, but, uh, but I think the reason why... Um, it's it's important is because it's it, it's because I th- I feel like LH was validating like he was you know saying that he didn't think that Captain Bill was making it up because a lot of people can't believe PDH and they can't believe that psychiatrists were brainwashing people and sending them into 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 Scientology right. organizations they can't believe that so it to me it was really good validation of Captain Bill and but because if he was full of crap um, LH never would have given a given him a car Khan and would, would uh, pulled him back um, from away from L.A. and would have punished him or something, saying, what the hell were you doing making up kooky land stuff about being PDH and stuff? And also, right. I think, I remember when I was reading it, um, that at I think L.I.H. increased ethics action at that time or something like that. Something went on. I think when I was reading your book, you mentioned something after it that makes me think that L.I.H. was like, oh, shit. They're really going that far. They're sending in people that are PDH, and he started to whip up his action or something. Oh, I, I don't recognize that part of the relation of it, but maybe you caught the date on it, but I, di- I didn't. Yeah, I, I picked up on something. Like, I think you mentioned something after it where LH got stricter about something, and I could see how LH was, you know, going, whoa, you know, like Cap- Cap- Captain Bill's, because Captain Bill's like an intelligence officer, like he's got that thinking, and he, he, so he went to LA, he found out this crazy shit that was going on, and then LH was like, whoa, that's what's going on out there, like the, it's just the attacks are just uh, amazing, you know, this is why we, we have, right. have all these hardcore sec checks and all these sorts of things, because it was just like, it was whoa, you know, and this is where I think someone said that the, someone said to me that the, the Church of Scientology is getting attacked more now, but... And I'm like, no, 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 it's getting attacked more then. Like, now it's getting attacked more in the media, like people making fun of it and, and crappy interviews on TV where someone's saying blah, 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 something like bad about it. Um, but they're, they're not actual attacks. They're just like verbal bullying. But like it's in the, very, right, yeah, it's in, very different. Yeah, but in the 70s, there were actual attacks. Like the Melbourne uh, org got burnt down in like 1980. Um, you had, Scientology was actually getting banned in countries and stuff, and then you had psychiatrists PDHing people. It was wild. Right, yeah. It's a very different kind of attack and a very different thinking because the government was more involved in the earlier days where now it's just mostly ex-scientologists making fun of it with other people who have never been in and the government staying out of it. Mm. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know... Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the church, but I I think that some bad guys have taken it over. What do you think about that? Uh, It's definitely gone in the wrong direction. Yeah. Did you notice a sudden change in, like, the early 80s? Well, I was right there in the early 80s, and that's that's been my book three. Um, While LRH was off the lines for everybody, he was still in touch with management, but I don't know what reports were being sent up to him, and I kept thinking, and I got pretty vocal about it, a concern about what reports were being sent up because I felt his answers coming down were overboard on what needed to be done. Then my getting vocal ended up with me being removed and labeled as um, disaffected. Yeah, which which seemed to happen to a lot of people who actually were good and were trying to solve problems. They just got labelled as as being, I don't know, needing to do the RPF or something like that. Yeah, yeah, but I was actually declared and offloaded, and then they went into panic mode when LRH wrote down and said, have Janice get out and run. And that was the very first order on the running program that I think, I don't know what they call it now. Uh, the, what's it called? 
the uh, run around cause the resurgence, hole. cause resurgence. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the first advice on that was on me because I was so disaffected with what was going on with the handling of uh, Scientology that based on the reports being sent to Hubbard, he said to have me get out and run, and that was to calm me down from my disaffection. Did you, did you do the running program? Yes, I, I, at that time, it was not around a pole. I just ran and ran and ran and ran all day. But what, what wasn't and, it, it wasn't in circles? No, not in the first advice. That came out later. When David Mayo was assigned to running, then the order came down and it said, there should be a pole there. Well, have them run around a tree, and then they put a pole there. And then, um, and didn't it also at that time, ethics started to go really crazy and uh, it was getting used as almost like a punishment, like torture <laughs> thing. And so, because I remember hearing David Mayo having to like, like, like I think Miss Cabbage got in charge of it or something, and he was just using it in such a bad way. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was definitely punishment mode. What, so when you did it, was it punishment mode as well? Well, it was supposed to be a case action, the running program. Mm. That was LRH's original intention when he said to have me get out and run. Mm. And I was told that my declare would be lifted if I came through this program successfully. And so I, okay, I went and I ran and ran and ran and ran. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but you, did, you didn't sort of, did you have someone like Miss Cabbage standing over your shoulder like saying, you run harder and like, was it like, sort of like that? No. Or? No, it was just me out there on my own running up and down the highway or through the golf course or wherever I felt like running. And I would get up in the morning, have breakfast, go run until lunchtime, have lunch, and then go run again until dinner. Interesting. Did you get much case? It was like case? doing marathons. Yeah, did you, get huh? ca- did you get case gain from that or...? You know, after having a desk job and stuff, getting out and running and exercising, you're definitely going to get case gain. You're going to be feeling a lot brighter. Yeah. Getting out, getting some sunshine, you know, no one on your back hounding you. Yeah, that would have keyed you out a bit, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I know a lot of people, they go for walks and that uh, when they're stressed or whatever because it's a good, good thing to just chill out, go for a walk yeah. or go for a run actually go for a run like I, I got a friend who was good at long distance running and he would he wasn't aware he was doing it but he would run for ages and he would almost go into like this meditative zone of like zonked outness of just running like this this just running and it, it actually keys the person out because it's just yes. like like similar it, i feel it's it when you when you get in that habit of running a lot you just do it automatically and it's kind of like sitting there doing tr zero like you're not moving because you're just in this habit of moving Right, right, yeah. And you just kind of, everything just goes. You don't have any worries or anything, you, and you just keep running. You don't have any cons- thoughts on your body or any problems, and you just run. It's interesting, because one time I accidentally, years ago, I think I was thinking about something, and I, I started walking in circles. And I think I accidentally did a little bit of the, this running program, this circles thing, because I don't know, I think I was walking in circles, thinking, thinking, thinking. And I really feel like, it, it made me like determined and I could think better and clearer. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I feel like my, when I was doing that, I was only for like a few hours, my, my cause went up. Like, honestly, my, my own self-determinism. Cause I was, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. And when I heard about the running program, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Like it, it's, it's like what I did for that one moment, but extrapolated over, is it weeks or something like that or? Yeah. Yeah. It was weeks. Wow. Anyway, it's interesting. Um, so, because I've heard some people mention that like in 1982, I think when the RTC came out or whatever, it was like, there was a sudden change in Scientology. It suddenly turned into like really strict and Nazi. Like, did yes. you notice that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I was right there watching it happen. That was part of my whole disaffection. Was that, was, was that, no, was that was when, no longer Scientology. Was that when Miss Cabbage took over basically? Yes. Because he was in charge of RTC? No, he was not in charge of RTC. He was actually in charge of doing all the corporate sort out and also in charge of um, Mission All Clear where he was running a mission that was supposed to handle all the lawsuits against LRH so he could come out of hiding and come back 
and be around everybody again. So, so did did uh, LRH actually order the creation of RTC? Yeah, RTC was ordered by him, and Annie Broker was the Inspector General as the head of RTC. And that's who, when LRH passed away, Annie was supposed to be the Inspector General and have RTC making sure that the tech isn't violated and changed. And all the committees that LRH had put in place were supposed to be operating because there was the watchdog committee, the exec strata committee. You know, there was various committees that were all supposed to coordinate and do management that way. Yeah. And what happened? And RTC was supposed to, you know, they had the trademarks and copyrights. And so they were supposed to, like, police it and just make sure it was running correctly. And what it was, everything was going great until about 87 when um, – and, and Miscavige was kind of like the chairman of coordinating those committees. He was coordinating them all. And we had affluences going with the uh, – statistically, internationally, it was in affluence. And then in 87, um, Annie and Pat, who had taken over, were asking for good crew met staff members to be sent up to work for them. And instead of them, when Hubbard died, instead of them coming and joining in with the rest of us, they stayed away and were expecting – Scientology to basically pay for them to raise racehorses, which is what they'd been doing as a cover when Hubbard was alive. That they'd, they'd had a ranch and had racehorses and stuff like that. And now, good staff members are being sent to them to work as ranch hands on Scientology money. And that is where what Miscavige did, I totally supported because. We were all working very hard with the management, and here's these people who are trying to raise racehorses coming in and with orders that didn't work with what we were doing. Why, and why, so that's, why were they continuing was, the cover? Why did they, why'd they continue the cover after LH passed away with the horses? That was because they were enjoying doing that. Now, what a lot of people <laughs> don't know what a lot of people don't know, and this is further support to why DM David Miscavige did what he did, is we didn't know that Pat Broker had actually been kicked out of Crest, uh, Creston by Hubbard about two years beforehand. Oh. And he was actually just a lackey to relay packages. So he really had no power, but... He and Annie got together because Annie, I guess, didn't feel strong enough to be the top dog and run the whole place. So she used Pat as support and they wrote the loyal officer um, issue, which was not by ah, Hubbard. Yeah, yeah that, make, that makes sense because, yeah, you can, I think the wording of it doesn't really sound like it's Hubbard or… Right, right. What was it, so, what, 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 hold on, what was the loyal yeah. officer issue talking about again? It basically said Pat and Annie were loyal officer one and two, and it and says it, that they were left in charge. And that and that and that Hubbard's um, retiring the Commodore label, and he's going to be called right. an admiral. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So they wrote that. Oh, it's so. It's, it's just so. It's such a mess. Yeah. So when you really know what was going on, what Miscavige did was it basically saved management and and everyone involved from having to deal with Pat and Annie and having to support a horse a horse ranch, you know, raising horses. Because it had nothing to do with Scientology. Why what um what made Pat and and, and Annie feel like they need to forge a, a com from L R H? Uh I don't know. Do you think um, Miscavige has forged comms from LIH? Uh, I, d I don't know. Do you, do you think he's modified c communication? Well, 
from what I've been told, I do know he modified communications going to LRH. I do know that, and I was told that by um, Saj, Steve Fouth, who's since passed away, but he'd said that Pat and David used to sit in the van together and retype reports that were being sent up to to Why? Him. Why? Um, either to make themselves look better. Like I always said, what went down with the mission holders, I always felt that that was based off of bad reports coming up from Miscavige to Hubbard about what was going on with the mission holders. Yes, exactly. Yeah, like they, they, they made him out to be all squirrels and stuff. Right, right. When Hubbard, for all the years I knew him, he never came down on mission holders like that. He said, oh, yeah, every now and again they'll go out ethics and you just pull them in and you clean them up and you send them back out there, you know, into the Wild West and they, they all feed the orgs. And they'll just keep feeding the orgs because, you know, they like the money they're making from feeding people up the bridge. Mm. And that's how he that's how he viewed the mission holders. And it was just keep the orgs there so there's a qualification areas that can pull them in and clean them up. Yeah, it's interesting. But then in 82, this thing comes out that's just it, – it, to me, when I looked at it, I thought this isn't just trying to get the mission holders um, money. This is to just destroy them, to shut them down, either to shut them down or actually force them to become a Class 5 org or whatever. Right. And from having worked with Hubbard, I knew that Hubbard would never want to destroy – the mission network because he knew that was the bread and butter for all those orgs. Mm. That's how those orgs got the majority of their people were from the missions. Yeah. And so by destroying them, that destroyed that whole feeder line. Yes. Uh, and yeah. They, yeah. And then later on, it was must have been about 83, I think, I was uh, posted as watchdog committee for the mission network. And the finance police had been in there just destroying it, ripping their money and declaring mission holders. And I was sent out to do an OBS mission because the stats kept crashing. Yeah. And I went out and observed several missions and saw the destruction. And I grew up in a mission myself, so I knew what it should be like. Yeah. And so when I came back from observing, I was made the watchdog committee for the mission network and it was so easy just to turn that network around. The first thing I did was kick out the finance police and then just tell them to just start communicating with people and disseminating. And it immediately started turning around and went into an affluence for years after that because it couldn't get worse than what it was. How um, how could – if LRH was still around, right? This is why I, I, I start to believe the theory that LRH should have passed away in 82 – um, is because, I mean, how could, how could they get away with doing such outrageous things? Like apparently they changed the OT levels, um, they destroyed the missions. I mean, how, if LH was still there, how did they get away with doing this stuff? Well, he was, he was off the lines and the only way to communicate with him was through the mail that David Miscavige took to Pat Broker. And that's where I said they would sit in the car and change the reports. Now, Hubbard had already had a fear going on because of the lawsuits and people chasing him and Nibs trying to claim that he was dead and trying to take control of the whole church. So when Hubbard gets the report about the mission holders, he's thinking that they were trying to take over and they were going to lose the church. But no, these people came in and saved the day. And it was all based off the reports going up from Miscavige. Um, why would Hubbard uh, choose messengers that are so unethical that they would change reports like Pat Broker and David Miscavige? He didn't know that they were doing that. But, but there's, there's something called sex checking and stuff. like. Oh. <laughs> I mean, well, good. I, let I, me tell you something. Hubbard did order Pat and David sex checked. Yeah. And that is why, what I've been told, the reason why Pat ended up being kicked out of Creston by Hubbard was because Pat did not pass on the sex check that Hubbard had ordered on Miscavige. 
because that sec check would have implicated Pat yeah. for whatever the two of them were doing together. I imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if that sec check went through to Hubbard on what Miscavige said, then Pat would have gotten in trouble. So Pat pulled it and it never got to Hubbard. What? But Hubbard had ordered sec checks on the two of them. Do you think it's possible that they could have been PDH'd? Uh, no, I don't think so. I just think I can't, it, it's sort of, it's odd. I mean, I'm, you know, I know Hubbard was an old man at this stage, but it's just odd that he would have been tricked by people, you know, like he, like I'm sure he knows the tone scale and who to trust and those sorts of things. But, you know, when people get older, they become more trusting of people. They don't really care as much as they used to they're not as aware as they used to be and he had more physical problems as the years went by what, did he so, start losing his marbles i did not see him but from what i've been told i would have to say yes what um what uh, wh where when did you last see him I last saw him in December 79. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, yeah. It, so after that, was it really just only like the brokers and Miscavige and, and who else would have no. actually seen him? Miscavige didn't see him. Didn't even see him. The, wow. It was just the brokers and Sarge, just those three. Who's Sarge? Sarge is Steve Falf. He was there as a – he used to do the, do, um, the runs of relaying – Male, and then he became a ranch hand and helping around the ranch. It's interesting. It's, it's so he really was in hiding. He really yeah, was hiding. Yeah, and, and Doctor Dink. Okay, and also yeah. apparently David Mayo. Uh, no, no, oh, I didn't see him. Oh, well, that would have been written communications. Yes, that was written communication. Just before Hubbard died, the only person besides Doctor Dink. Pat, Annie, and Sarge, the only person that saw him was um, Ray Midoff. Hmm. LRH called for Ray to come up to give him his last auditing session before he passed away. When, when, when was that? In uh, January 86. Uh, what was his health like at that stage? Well, he'd already had a couple of strokes, and he, he was not in good shape, and he'd been on a diet of apple cider, so he was very skinny, and uh, he had a lot of headaches, and uh, Sergeant said when he was signing his last will, he was walking up and down the motorhome, moaning and groaning about having a headache and to hurry up so that he could just sign the papers and go lie down. Okay, what did you? I've heard this idea that apparently he was trying to get rid of body thetans and he blew he blew himself up. I mean, what the hell was that? Do you believe that at all? He didn't blow himself up. From what Sarge told me, Sarge was told to come up with some meter that would help get rid of these body thetans and would help LRH actually uh, shut down his body, but. In, but Sarge did it so that the meter blew up instead because he didn't want to be responsible for anything happening to Hubbard. Okay, but but the, that story that Hubbard died ordering himself, that's not really true. No. Like, no. It, it did sort of sound like a bit wild. It was just like, whoa, like it, it's like some crazy experiment that he died. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. No, his last session was done by Ray Midoff. What would that have been about? Would that be, have been like a, a dying assist or something? Yeah, well, Ray said to me after he came back, he said, I finally got to meet Hubbard. I gave him his last session. He had me run on him the process that he had CSK supervised for my mother when she passed away in 78. What's, what process is that? And I, I've never read what the process was, but I was told it was a process where you end up telling them to find a planet and go and run around the planet. Now, maybe that's where he came up with the running program, 
before he died and after my mother's death to run around the pole because here he was having them run around a planet as a Satan. As a Satan, yeah. 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 Um, wow. So he definitely died in early 86. Yes. Um, interesting. Interesting. Would you think there would have been any body doubles at, around at that time or no? <laughs> no. No? No? No. And, you know, there's this whole thing about there being a body double in 72. There was no body double in 70, 72 or 73 or any years. It's so odd, though. I mean, the people say stuff like they, they came across, um, like, I think maybe it was Ken Urquhart or someone said that they noticed that he would be wearing different size clothes or something. Different size clothes? Yeah, like actual shoe sizes would change. Oh, you know, that was written by someone who called themselves Cowboy that the shoes weren't fitting. And there were times where he, it's the same clothes, but I was like, these don't seem to be fitting right. Yeah, and he, he would get very mad about it and irritated. But that's not because of there was a body change. It was the same person. I, um, I, I think there were some photos in your book, and I, I've seen them on the internet as well that I came across. Because I'm not, I'm not ruling out the body double theory because when I saw these photos... Um, I would just look at them and I was like, that does not look like LRH. I was just like, that just looks like a man about the same age, about the same height as, as L. Ron Hubbard. It, I don't know why, but I just, I just, just like, that does not look like him. Right. Well, you know, Randy McDonald, um, he wrote a book under the name of Ashton Gray or something like that called the watergate watergate the yes Hoax. yeah i heard about that okay yeah. have you read that no okay. I, I, re I read a small part because it referred references me and uh he re talks about myself and ken and other friends of mine all who had worked with hubbard and when randy was doing the research for that book he called me and he brought up the same thing about the body double, thinking that Hubbard was switched out in 72 or 73. And so when, as I'm talking to him, he's like, Janice, you know, you're blowing me away because this doesn't fit with what I have. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, it doesn't fit, but this is the truth. And so then he, he felt that, Ken and myself and the others had all ganged up together and come up with a short story to give him, but we didn't. We were all just telling the truth. And, it, and I'll tell you, when we were in Morocco in uh, September 72, we moved to shore. We lived in Morocco until December 72. And then LRH left. And went to, back to the ship where the ship was in Lisbon. So we all stayed in Tangier. He went over to Lisbon. When he got to Lisbon, he couldn't go back on the ship because it was still under renovation and everything was torn apart. There was no way he could live there with, with his allergies and things like that. So he was like, where do I go? So that's when he decided he would go to New York until the ship was, was refitted and back in shape for him to be there. So... Paul Preston and Jim Dinkelsey went with him to New York and were there for like nine months, from December 72 until September 73. When they came back, and when Hubbard came aboard, it was the exact same person who I had seen when he left Tangier in December 72. It was the same person. He came aboard, he saw me, just kind of nodded at me, and then went, he knew exactly where to go to get to his cabin. On his way to his cabin, Pam Kemp is coming up the stairs. And she's all excited to say hello to him because she hasn't seen him, but is an old friend from the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And he ignores her. And he turns to me and he says, get Mary Sue. So I run upstairs and I get Mary Sue and he went straight to his cabin. Mary Sue came down went to his cabin, was there for about an hour, and when he came out, he had a haircut. And he was redressed, 
He had showered. He was dressed in his regular ship clothes. And then he stopped and started talking to people and saying hi to them. And it was the same man. He recognized everybody. He knew his way around the ship. When we went out to sea, it was the same man on the bridge. He knew the operation of the ship, all that kind of stuff. There was no way you can put someone in his place and have them know all those things and where everything was. There's no way. And, and that you didn't notice any physical looks that had changed? No. Well, I think it's no. odd. Like, so, so this person um, who wrote this book thinks that, um, that he died at that, at that time and uh, he never came back. And it was a body double after that. Is that what he thinks? Right. Well, that's what he, that's thinks, what he thinks. Yeah, he really thinks that because I, ha- I, 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 I could just come. It doesn't make any sense. Like because who wrote Mission Earth then? I mean, Mission Earth right. sounds. It's whoever wrote it was a damn genius. I love. Have you read the books? Yeah, yeah. you have. Yeah, did, did, I, I've, I'm not. I'm not into the big sci-fi stuff. So I read the books and I was like, oh, okay, but I don't get excited about them. Did it? Did you find there was a lot of truth put in that? Well, it's a lot of what he has in um, in the OT materials. Yes. Well, like as in, um, as in, like he, things that occurred in his life put into that story. Yes. Yeah. And, and there's even things that in those stories. Is happening nowadays where he talks about, you know, the, the microchips being implanted in people for their credit cards. Yeah, I know, that's, yeah. That's being done today. I know, yeah. He, it was a real whistleblower book. I mean, I'm, 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 I listened to the audio book, which was condensed, and, and it, was ent- it was so entertaining because it's like, it's just, yeah, but I'm looking forward to reading it and getting the hardcore data. But the audio book was so funny. Like, whoever they got to do the voices and all this sorts of stuff, they're really well acted out. I think it was made, you know, probably when you were around in, like, 87 or something. Oh, I've never listened to them. Oh, I, I think, read- yeah. Well, the actors do a really funny job of doing the characters. And, and, they, and I think they take a massive story and they condense it into 30 hours. So you, I think oh, okay. you get the overall storyline and you can yeah. still enjoy it and stuff. But I think it cuts out all the specific detail. Um, so, so what about this OT levels changing in the early eighties? You know, I don't know them changing the early eighties. I know in the late eighties when they came up with OT eight, or are you talking from the old OT I'm talking, seven? yeah, I'm talking about the originals. Like I think they changed in 82, or 83 to the new, uh, these new things. In 78, I believe it was, is when Knots came out. Yeah, but then apparently in 82, there was no longer OT5, it was new OT5. Well, yeah, that was was the Knots. That was Knots, and yeah, and instead of doing the old OT levels... Yeah, they got rid of them. Which were more of people trying to use OT abilities. Yeah. They got rid of that. Yeah. And, and Hubbard was part of that. Really? He was part of yeah, getting rid of them? Which kind of surprised me because the I did the old OT levels and I enjoyed doing those. Those were fun. Hold on a because second. It was, I, it was mental exercises. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. I don't, I don't know if I can sort of believe you because he was hidden away. I mean, barely anyone saw him. Who, who says that he, he did that? You know what I mean? You got Miscavige no, who's was changing that the comms. That was done in the 70s before he left. The, 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 to, the change to the new OT levels. Yeah. Yeah, that was done in the late 70s, 78 and 79. And, and you've got to remember, too, that he gives an orders and he writes stuff out and it go, will go to his um, RTRC, LRH, LRH Tech and Comps, Mm. compilations and they will take all that stuff and write the bulletins for him and send them up to him for approval based off of all his notes and things like that Mm. but where I noticed there was some stuff off and that was with the release of OT8 because I'd been talking to Ray Midoff and he was telling me when he had to put the OT8 package together it was just notes 
there was hardly anything and no direction or anything. So they just, he had that just kind of compiled and put together. And it was not some direct instructions of this is how it's to be done. So they were flying by their seat of the pants and putting that together. They would have been smarter to go back and get those old OT levels that were moved to the side and put those out there. Because a lot of more, a lot more people who did those had a lot more fun with them. I don't know what to believe. I think it's all such a mess. It's just such a confusion <laughs> of just what the hell. And then one person says this, another person says that. Um, yeah. Well, the person who would know the best is Dan Coon. Dan Coon was it. What ran that whole area? And saw all the advices and different things like that. That's the man to talk to. It's, yeah, something definitely, I reckon, went bad um, in 78 onwards. Like, actually, it was probably 77 when uh, the the church got raided or whatever. I think yeah. from there onwards, did you notice a change from there onwards that things just started to go wild? Um, well... 78 when it got raided is sorry 77 is when he left and went to sparks nevada with uh three messengers and then when he came back in january mary sue had been moved to la by that point and um that's when he decided to just work on the films the tech films and train people through the tech films and then um, he was very, very moody throughout that whole period. And then when he got sick in 78, he, he nearly died. And David Mayo was pulled out from FLAG to come and audit him. And that is when, after he got well, is when the knots um, came out. Came out. Yeah. And that was all th through the direction of Hubbard to Mayo and Melanie Murray telling them what to write in the bulletins and how to do it. And, and David would talk to him and they'd talk back and forth and, you know, fix things up. It's wild. The whole thing is just what the hell, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I think that, I think the tech was good and trustworthy and everything up to, up to 77. Okay. I think that I think something when it, when I think the something went like you know after Mary like because the, the geo went, was just wild after seventy seven or whatever and I don't know I just feel like Hubbard had like he was still on lines but he was kind of off lines from seventy seven onwards wasn't he? He was still on lines. Yeah, but I'm like as in but Miscavige was controlling him though. No, Miscavige was a nobody in those days. So you reckon up until eighty, he was he was pretty much online, and then after that, he was kind of semi right. online. Yes. Yeah. So what was he doing those last five years of his life? Well, that's where he was at. Uh, he was traveling around in the RV, and uh, then when they got Creston, he settled down there. He lived in the RV while they were fixing up the house for him to live in. And he just, you know, traffic would be sent up to him and he would answer that or he'd, re he'd take himself in session, wander around, see the animals. The horses. Yep, the horses. Um, and he was, because it seemed like he, uh, it seemed, I was looking at the, the Red Vols and it seemed like, I think, 82, like it sort of, he stopped riding as much in the Red Vols. Right. Yeah, is that because he started to get into the whole fiction thing? Yeah, well, he started doing the yeah he started doing Battlefield Earth and Mission Earth instead. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just, it's, just uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny trying to lay down the the truth of it. The story is such a mess. Um, was when you say Annie Broker, her name was originally Annie Tidman. Was it? Yes. And she yes. was on the Apollo with you? Yes. Yeah. What was... Yeah. 
She came when she was 12 years old. Okay. Why would Hubbard choose a bad... Is, so is Pat Broker a bad guy? Pat Broker is... No, I wouldn't say he's a bad guy. Um... Was Pat, he alcoholic? Pat was a good friend of mine. He was, was he, a good friend. Was he an alcoholic? You know, I knew him back on the ship. And um, he was fun, but he he wasn't a manager or, he, you know, yeah, he wasn't a smart manager. Was he an alcoholic? He was alcohol- mostly finance. Was he an was alcoholic? He was he an alcoholic? Um, I've heard that. Uh, when I was around him, he wasn't, but then I wasn't with him for those last years. So I have heard that he was drinking a lot. When you say the last years, you mean from when 83 onwards or something? Yeah. Well, I hadn't seen him from, um, 80. I hadn't seen him from 80 until 86. And then I saw him in 86 a couple of times. And, uh, so when I saw him in 86, I, he wasn't drinking. I had heard from others that he'd been drinking, and that was part of the whole part of Miscavige taking over from Pat and Annie because not only were they trying to have the race, the breeding of horses as a priority or, you know, something they did, um, there was a lot of drinking, from what I was told, going on up at Creston at the ranch with the crew that we were sending up there and Pat and Annie, where the rest of us were working, you know, with our attention on Scientology and the management of it, these guys are off partying and having drinking every night from what I was told. Now I wasn't there, so I don't know how truthful that is, but that's one of the reasons that I was told for Miscavige's takedown of them. Do you think Miscavige is evil? (laughs) You know, from what I've been hearing, there is a lot of evil things that he has done. I, I heard. So the answer would be yes, but in the earlier days when I knew him, he was all right. It, it was all right. They, I, the evilness, like what I've I've heard of him doing, was not there. Maybe he hadn't thought of it yet, or he wasn't in a position of power enough for that to show through. But he, what he's been doing is not right. Captain Bill reckons that Miscavige was a good uh, young guy doing his OT3, I think, and then he just turned into a raving psychotic or whatever, um, like a real, like, SP. Um, And he was talking about 85, I think, when he was saying this. Um, So he he reckons that that Miscavige had his body taken over or something, some some real space opera sort of thing. Um, right. Well, yeah. you know, during those days, you, DM could be fun, loving, laughing, you know, down to earth, and then something could happen and it would trigger off a whole different valence, you know, where he would just get into this whole severe reality adjustments to people and face ripping and... And that's what he did when I was there. But since then, I've heard him go even further. So was busy. Was he this really angry person prior to eighty two? No, not not in general. No. So no. do do you think that's possible in any way at all? Some sort of like body takeover. I mean, I think in your book you mentioned that LRH actually said that 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 someone. Has you get, like you? Someone's name was mentioned, and L H said, um, "Yeah, he had his body taken over, or something, or he's no longer the same Satan." Yeah, and that could happen, but with with Dave, um, you know, even from what I've been hearing, he can still be charismatic. You know, if you do what he wants, or you're a friend of his, he can be charismatic. But if you're not getting done what he wants, then that's when he goes with the penalties because obviously he doesn't know how to properly manage something that he's going into these unusual solutions and thinking running these people on fear is what's going to get things done. Where Mm. 
It doesn't work that way. That's not Scientology or what Scientology was about when I was growing up in it. You d it wasn't about fear. It was about helping people and making them more aware and better in their lives. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I've still got a bunch of questions to, uh, to ask you, um, but I want to I wanna, I wanna make, this, make this clear. Did, did LIH say that a, a body can get taken over by some other Thetan? Yes. So, yeah, he has said that. Well, I, I can believe that because I, I look at a lot into aliens and UFOs and all this sorts of stuff, and I understand that it's possible they can have advanced technology and they can do these sorts of things. But, but, but what's his face? Captain Bill said something like basically the um, – it's in the bungalow briefing. Have you listened to that? No. It's on YouTube. Captain Bill? Yeah, it's on YouTube. It's oh, a bungalow okay. briefing. It's really interesting. It's really high level data. It's totally out gradient, right? Okay. But, um, he says that like um, basically the the other being just comes along and just knocks the Thetan out and says, Go, go, go back to your implant station and sends it off and then the body's taken over. Right. And when I admit, when I talked to Hubbard about that, he had mentioned it usually happens when there's an ingram. The person gets hurt and another Thetan comes in and takes it over and the other one leaves when it probably should have died, but another one took over that body. Did he mention it occurring in like a way to like get SPs into the organization or you know what I mean? No, no, but he... See, right now you have a situation of there's more SPs than LRH said they're supposed to be. There's only supposed to be 2%. Hmm. Right now it's like anybody who knew LRH is now considered an SP, unless you're David Miscavige. But every all these people that have worked with him in 30 years in the Sea Org, you know, dedicated their lives. It's like, wait a minute, are you saying the tech doesn't work, that these people have suddenly all become SPs or nobody yeah. knew they were SPs in the first place? It, that's that's wrong. Those mm. are good people, dedicated people who have been abused. And the whole disconnect of disconnecting from SPs, these people are not SPs. Yeah, I know, yeah. And that's that's what's wrong about the whole disconnection. Mm. It, then the disconnection is being used to control people mm. because if all these people that were good staff members for 30 years are now on the other side, if they tell the people who are still locked up on the inside what's really going on, then you can't control the people. But yeah. as long as you've got disconnection, those people on the inside are never going to hear the true stories of what's been going on. I know, so we can't so, get reform. Right, yeah. because those people on the insides, they're doing their job and they're, you know, go, running around in their little cages not knowing what is going on with everybody else or the world. And they just think all these SPs are there attacking them because they're trying to help the world. When that's not why these SPs are attacking them. You mentioned that, that, that there was a UFO scene at St. Hill. I found that interesting. Yeah. Did you see that? No. Well, I did not see the one they were talking about. The, um, the, the people on the OT levels at St. Hill or the clearing course, that was a big thing. Everyone talking about spaceships and one lady would talk about one that landed and as a Thetan she left her body and went inside the spaceship and looked around. There was a lot of stories like that. Um at St. Hill. Do you know what's interesting as well? <laughs> Apparently Captain Bill said something like in this bungalow briefing, he said how, um, he said, he goes, oh, you know, I used to, I heard the story that LIH was in communication with um, some UFOs or aliens or whatever. And he goes, I, I, I didn't believe it. But then I looked into it and he goes, and now I believe it. It's really true. Apparently, he was in communication. And then, and then I read in your book this this story that they saw a UFO at at uh, Saint Hill, and it's uh, it's kind of interesting, you know. Like, 
the, some of the stuff that comes out of Captain Pill's mouth is just incredible. But I'm, I'm looking right. into it. I'm looking into it, and it's making sense. You know, so I don't know. You know, if LRH was in communication with UFOs, but honestly, it wouldn't surprise me. Right. Well, I know back in '78, Hubbard had said that the Maccabians were coming, and they'd be coming in about five years' time. Well, so that should have been '83. Wow. And That's an interesting date in Scientology. Yes. Did you mention anything more about the Maccabians? No. That's all I remembered him saying. It's interesting. It's interesting. Um, so did you see any other, any other UFO sightings or anything in history? Well, you know, on the bridge at night, you know, he would point out and say that that's a UFO. And then he'd, tell, he'd look at the stars and he'd talk about different clusters of stars and how there was this big battle going on up there. And these people wore um, cowboy shirts and cowboy hats and, and beige pants, or, you know. <laughs> he would just, and he, he could stand there for hours on the bridge as we're sailing along and there's just a slight breeze and we're going through the water, nothing else is happening except for Hubbard standing there talking and everyone on the bridge kind of leaves their job and all hang out on that side of the bridge listening to his stories for hours. <laughs> and the, Yeah, and you don't know if it's true or not. You know what I mean? Right. right. But he's a good storyteller, isn't he? Like just wow, you know? Oh, oh, yeah, you could sit wow. there and listen for hours as he told these stories, and you don't know where he came up with them, whether it was true or if he's making it up. You just don't know. What would be an example of one of the stories? Well, I, I just told you one with the spaceship, with the uh, planets and the battle and that type of thing. And the cowboys. Yeah. yeah. And then there was a time, you know, we were sailing past some islands, some Greek islands, and there's these little crosses and I was up on the bridge with him, and he was telling me a story about having buried treasures under each of those crosses in a past life. And that he'd been a prince with a lot of treasures, and he'd buried them there and covered it up as a Christian, you know, as a religious thing. But that's where her treasures were. Did you he, did he ever recover any of these treasures? No. Any, any success? I do know, like, well, I know from Mission Into Time... Um, one of the missionaries who went ashore to find the old treasures that he was saying they're here, she did come back with a coin. Okay. I know, <laughs> so I do know that something was found. Oh. And then according to another crew member, he was going through some of those old debriefs from crew members who had done those mission into times. And he'd found some coins in their debriefs. Interesting. So, yes, treasures were found. Um, when, you, when you mentioned that story where LH pointed something out in the sky and said that was a UFO, what, what did it look like that it was pointing at? Oh, well, it, it, the rest of the sky was stars, and this one thing was just moving, and then it disappeared. What did, what, so did it look like a distant light or something? At first, yeah. Look, yeah, it looks like a distant light, and then suddenly it just disappears. So he had it, was, it didn't come close. It didn't come close or anything like that. He could, he could spot UFOs, basically. Yeah. It's really interesting because uh, in his book, uh, Battlefield Earth, um, he describes a UFO in that that is one of the ones that um, – have you read the book? Yes. A long, the, when it first came out. Yeah, one, one that comes like a sphere and then like when it – when it disappears, it, it flashes and goes, makes a big ball of light and flashes and disappears. Anyway, just recently I was listening to an interview with Tom DeLonge about aliens and they, him and Joe Rogan mentioned a video on YouTube and I was like, oh, I'm going to check out this video and I watch it and I'm like, this is, this is the description that Elrond Hubbard was talking about in Battlefield Earth of a UFO and it shows, it shows it doing the ball thing and then flashing and then lighting and it's just so interesting, you know, and you're seeing yeah. it in real life. It's just like, wow. Yeah, and I have seen videos like that, just like as he describes. Yeah, because in that in that Battlefield Earth, there's a lot of different types of UFOs, isn't there? And different, yeah, like the cigar shaped and right. 
it's interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> There's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of history of unusual beings popping up on earth and then apparently being communication with off world things. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Like Jesus and stuff like the Jesus story. Like a lot of it seems to be lights in the sky and like these angel beings come down and it's just like their interpretation seems to be that it's like it's God or, you know, spirits. And it's just like, I don't know. You know? Right. Right. Well, you know, there's a story when when I was 17, my sister and I went to Mexico where my mother was with Heber. And we went out to some pyramids out there and climbed to the top of the pyramid. And Heber was telling us, my sister and I is like, oh, over there is where the entrance is to the pyramids is by those trees. And it's a tunnel that goes underneath. And suddenly oh. it was like these winds were hitting us trying to push us off the top of that pyramid wow. and these clouds were coming in on us and I look around and nobody else on that top of the pyramid had winds hitting them like we it was hitting us and he was like oh I gotta tell him it's okay and so he was just mentally was like it's okay we're not gonna do anything with this and the wind just calmed right down did you reckon like communicate to the to the people in charge of that area or something well he what Heber explained it as Thetans that were there on guard of the pyramid. Yeah, like it'd been cursed. It'd been cursed. Yeah, like the right. mummy or something, the mummy movie or something like yeah, that. Yeah, or all these Thetans, their job was to guard that entrance. And here he was telling us where it was. So they were getting mad at him. Wow. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Wow. Wow. Do you, do you yeah. believe that good Scientology tech... Um, can really give people these sort of abilities to do telepathy and stuff? You know, I, I think um, with training, people can do that, yes. Yeah. Not necessarily Scientology. There's a lot of different technologies out there. Uh, Scientology has a little bit, you know, there's all sorts of different things. And... You can take little bits of it and people can get become more aware and more aware and achieve more things through mental training. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, I kind of like in your book how um, you mentioned the, um, the other point of view of how the Sea Org uh, functions, like as in you mentioned, you mentioned in the book – yeah, but these people are trying to save the planet. You know what I mean? Like, as right. in, I, you could you could understand that point of view, and I kind of like that because sometimes when you get people who write books that attack Scientology and stuff, they say, "Oh, how could LRH do this? Or how could this Sea Org member do that?" But they, it's like, hold on a second, we're saving the planet. You know what I mean? It's a whole different ball game. You know, and that's I right. and and that's why I've thought about joining the Sea Org uh, when I was a church member. Um, because I've got that, I've got that reality. Like I understand that it's just like, no, hold on. You're dealing with a serious thing. It's just like, who cares about a birthday? Who cares about um, starting a family? It's just like, no, like serious shit's going down here on Earth, and saving the planet's the most important thing. And I, I think people who are Scientology haters, they can't understand that viewpoint of really caring about humanity as a whole, as opposed to their married partner or their sibling. Do you know what I mean? Right. Right. It's that dedicated glare in their eyes. Yeah. Over that dilettante. Yeah. Who is out there not helping, but having too much fun rather than becoming dedicated to help make it a better world. And I know when you're in there, you have that dedication and you believe in what you're doing. And so yeah. for, for people like Leah and Mike and so forth to be doing what they're doing to expose what's going on, these dedicated people just feel that their dedication and their whole purpose is being attacked. I remember when I got into – see, because I was brought up in the what I would call the corrupted civilization because I feel like things were actually good in the 50s. You know, like as in there wasn't a huge amount of drugs. There wasn't as much crime. There wasn't completely bankrupt nations. There wasn't tons of propaganda. And LRH could see that all this crap was coming. 
and he was trying to fight it. And that's why the, the whole the whole thing was just like, you know what, just who cares about your body even? Let yourself get cancer or whatever. Just just go out there and just do this. You know what I mean? It's just total. And I feel like that's how LIH approached his own life. Like, I don't, I, if he wanted to, he could have tried to live to 150 and could have focused on bending spoons with his mind. But he was just like, no, this is what I've got to do. I've got to smash it out. I've got to, like, this crazy stuff's going on. He, he, like, he knew about, like, the government, um, like, abducting people and brainwashing them and, and possibly microchips coming out and stuff. And he just knew all this crazy shit. And he was just like, we've got to do something about it, you know? Right. Yeah. So when I came into Scientology, I was like, I was brought up in, in this corrupted world and I felt like I was in a bad shape. And and when I saw how the church was good in fixing people and stuff, it really, it really rang true to me because I was like, yes, I don't want people brought up in families where drugs is a normal thing. I don't want people brought up in families where there's divorce and where there's, you know, this, this whole materialist materialism thing where there's no spirituality. Right. So it really rang with me because I was like, yes, it, anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about, but yeah. <laughs> well, well that, that's why I believe, you know, it's up to each individual as to what is right for them or what they feel is right for them because everybody has a right to their own beliefs. You know, whether you believe in God or Christianity or Scientology or you're Jewish or, you know, everyone has a right to whatever they want to believe. And so when you're attacking something and trying to make, think that that person's thinking wrong, well, that's not right that you're attacking it. You've got to let everyone make their own decision. If they had wins on doing something, then they had wins. Who are you to say they didn't? Hmm. That's how that's how I look at it. What sort of person was L. Ron Hubbard like? Like I, I know you mentioned he like he had outbursts of anger when he like yeah. he wanted something done or something. Is that was that how it is? Like as in if somebody didn't do an order, he would just tear their head off or whatever. Or? You know, he had varying ways on how he dealt with things. There, if if nothing was bothering him. He could be very charismatic and laughing and talking and chatting away, you know, telling stories and stuff like that. And then if he finds something wrong, he could be very explosive about it until it's handled. And once it's handled, he would come right down and get back into his jolly self again. You know, so if he felt you were against him, then you had to deal with that wrath coming from him but if he knows that you're working with him then you're okay but what's interesting is there's people who worked with him for a long time and that when they fall out of good graces with him they become the enemy and it's, and i used to think well wait a minute they used to work with him so closely why is he now saying this and that's when i would kind of go well, something is wrong here for someone to have dedicated themselves and been so right and worked so closely with him that then they fail as an executive and they should never be an executive again. That's like saying Scientology doesn't work. Yeah. But you, you know what I'm saying there? Yeah, is it, is it kind of – I'm trying to think of it from his point of view. Is it just – is it the fact that he was just being totally strict on everyone and saying, you've got to be this perfect OT, otherwise you're out? Yeah, and, and it, you, well, otherwise you had to be rehabilitated. And then you had to go and get Scientology processing to correct whatever was wrong with you. And then he did used to say, for ethics to be out, there, ha there was out tech before. So he was saying that there was order to mistakes made on somebody for them to then land in ethics trouble. And he, and that's where he'd say, okay, go in and pull their PC folder and do a study of it and find out where the out list is or whatever is wrong and get that corrected so that the ethics would go back in. He did used to push that a lot. Wow. Um, as as a young um, a young girl, w when did you first start doing your bridge? Um, I did my 
I had a little auditing as a kid just growing up, you know, get touch assists and CCHs and that type of thing. But then when I went to St. Hill at 10 years old, there was a lot of students there doing the briefing course, training to be auditors, and they needed PCs. And so they would look for someone to order, and there I was at 10 years old. So I was given, I started at grade zero at St. Hill and went all the way through grade four with student auditors doing the briefing course. Yeah. And, and when, um, when did you achieve the state of clear? You know, I didn't do the clearing course until 77. I, I I got my grade five and five A power processing probably in 1969, and I was happy. I didn't want any more auditing. You know, I didn't feel I needed it. I felt in control of my life. Every, things things were good, and uh, even though on the ship for the next five, six years, people kept trying to, come on, you got to go do your clearing course. I just wouldn't go do it. I had no interest in it whatsoever. And then finally, I guess at 19 years old, I said, okay, they're going to keep bothering me to do it until I get it done. So I sat down and I did it. Yeah. And so is that, is that after that you get your clear certificate? Yeah, then I got the clear certificate, that then I did OT1, 2, 3, and I did all the way through the old OT7 before they came out with knots. Oh, so you, that's before 78? Yes. Wow, so you got you did get a fair bit done before 78. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did all the way up to old OT7. And that's where I'm saying those processes were are fun. very different and they were fun. I enjoyed doing those. Those were things where you had to get someone to send you telepathy. You had to get someone somewhere in the world to send you a postcard. A mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like actually had to. And, yeah. and when that postcard shows up, you are like, oh, my God, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. And so and that's where you, you didn't do any more of the bridge after that? No, I, I did. Uh, well, I did. I was audited on um, what's now OT5, 6, and 7. I did that. I, I didn't finish it. But, um, yeah, and then I left in uh, 1990. All right. And and that's um, – I imagine you're going to go into details on that in the last book. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah, because book two will go from the end of book one, which is October 70. And it'll and book two goes until October seventy five when we when we move off the ship and we invade America. Yeah, <laughs> the the Project Normandy storming yes. the beaches. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah. And uh, that's what Hubbard called it. He called it Project Normandy. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what's good yeah. about it as well? Is I um I got the uh, the book in electronic form that you sent me, and I put it in a form so that I can listen to it spoken on my phone, right? Oh, okay. Because you don't use um, heaps of fancy words, which is great because you don't have to look many things up. So it's very, it's very easy to, you know, understand and, and listen to and stuff. So it's great to, to listen to in like that audio book form. Right. Um, so if anyone uh, wants to do that, it's something you can listen to when you're driving and, and those sorts of things. It's, it's really, really handy, really suits that, you know, which is great. Yeah. I've had people asking, when's the audio book coming out? And I did recently sign a contract with an audio company. So that should be coming out pretty soon. But I didn't know that there was software to do that with. Yeah, on the iPhone, you can just do this thing where you swipe down on the screen, you press play, and it plays whatever's on the screen. I think oh, I – no, okay. actually, no, no, sorry. You can do that, but with a book, it's a real pain in the ass because you can't track where you're up to, what chapter. Um but I had there's there's apps out there where you, can, where you can do it, but you have to fiddle around. You have these problems, and it's a pain in the ass. Like when I did it with your book, um, it kind of came in sort of the wrong order. But see, it's such a simple story, I could still follow along with it, you know. Right. But yeah, that'd be great if you had a really good audio book. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, it makes it really easy. Um, so, uh, did you see anyone who was PDH'd? 
Um, I did a project where I had to find qualified executives and everyone had to be checked on the meter to see if they'd been PDH'd. And there was one gentleman who, who actually admitted to it, saying he'd been PDH'd. And, what and, was, what, um, and did he know what he was sent in to do? He, well, he was saying he was sent in to kill Hubbard. <laughs> and so he obviously got sent out? Well, yeah, yeah, he, yes, he was definitely sent out because of that. And was this, I, on, I sorry, was this on the Apollo? Pardon? Was this on the Apollo? This was when we were in, um, in Hemet. Oh. And, and I used to wonder, is this guy just kind of making this up or is this true? But the author kept saying that the reads were there on the e-meter for everything the guy was talking about. And he was remembering, you know, being, being drugged and given these instructions. Wow. Does he remember who did them? Who, you know, I have to sit down and rack my brain on that. CIA? No, I, I don't remember who he had said. Yeah, I mean, we have to recontact that auditor and find out. But, oh, but the way they would have done it is it would have been set up so that it would be impossible for him to ever know who was really doing it anyway. You know what right. I mean? Like it would be all right. done secret and, you know. It's so deep and so interesting. Like, like um, you mentioned in your book that there was an assassination attempt on your father in Australia. Oh, yeah, the, he was threatened with it, yes. Um, so what do you mean threatened, like, as in, yeah, explain that. Uh, well, he was, he was down there um, trying to handle the ban on Scientology and um, the Guardian's office are the ones who found out about it, that uh, there was a threat coming on his life because he was claiming to he was going to investigate the different people in Parliament who were against Scientology. Oh. And that's where the threat was coming from, was from a member of Parliament. Now, hold on a second. So you, are you saying the member of Parliament contacted one of his goons or something and said, you've got to take this guy out, or what? What do you think? That is what the Guardian's office was basically saying. And my father was the target. Because yeah. my father was threatening, he was saying, we're going to investigate you. And find so, out about, like, crimes, potential pedophilia and other weird yes, things. Yes, yeah. right, right. So, yeah, his life was threatened. And what did your father do at that point then? Uh, he still kept going. He wasn't going to back down. And then he finished what he was supposed to do and left the country. Did, so he didn't do any did any special going to hiding or anything? or No, no. He's not that type. Some people are so quick to criticise Hubbard. Like they would say that in his final years he was um, paranoid and it's just like – they don't really know what was going on behind the scenes and were, the, the people were literally trying to assassinate him and stuff. And and the same with Howard Hughes as well. They go, Howard Hughes was like crazy and paranoid and stuff. But Howard Hughes was like this big rich guy that was pissing people off who were in power right. and he had to go into hiding as well, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there was definitely reasons for Hubbard to be in hiding. Definitely. Yeah. And it wasn't just to avoid paying taxes. No, there were actual threats on him. Mm. And and uh, I find it interesting you mentioned he had some allergy problems. Uh, yeah, what was the deal with that? <laughs> I talk about that in book two. Uh, he was um, – smells. He was, he was allergic to feathers, um, perfumes, various different smells. And that's when he would just – be unbearable to be around but wouldn't but i mean people would say you know especially people who don't like scientology they'll go but, but isn't the auditing supposed to cure allergy problems and stuff right and you know it's funny because other people people even on the ship would say oh that's just because his ot abilities he's so much more sensitive to these type of things because his awareness is so high and i'm like no, he has allergies. <laughs> oh, but, but when? But when did the allergy thing just start? Did it happen all of a sudden? No, it didn't. Uh, you know, 
it didn't happen. It wasn't that bad before he came to the U.S. When he came to the U.S. in 73 uh, is when it started getting acting up. And when he came back, he started getting allergy shots. And he kept getting allergy shots yeah. because it would get so bad. I mean, we used to have to, the stewards would wash his clothes, but he'd smell perfume. Even though they weren't washed in perfume, he could smell it. And we'd have to rinse his shirts maybe 20 times before he'd finally say, okay. I've heard that story. Yeah, yeah something or, like or that. Yeah, or we'd have to convince him that it was okay. I know, I know, I, I had some problems with allergies and, and uh, perfumes and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It, it, would, it would give me tension in my neck and stuff and uh i had to see naturopaths and, and stuff like that and so that's when when i heard people having a go at him for like making a fuss about perfume i was kind of like hold on a second i agree with him on that i believe everything should be natural right. and we should be all sort of living that sort of hippie lifestyle <laughs> and stuff and and I, I don't like synthetic clothes and those sorts of things and anyway but yeah it's interesting yeah um wally burgess did you know him I've known Wally since 1959. Wow. So back in Melbourne? Yeah. When we drove in from Euroa to Melbourne, you know, the hillbillies from the country coming into the city, Wally met us at the Hazzy. And then my mother helped Wally set up the Melbourne Congress. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's really interesting because um, I've got some family history, I think, in Euroa. Is that near, is that near Omeo? Omeo, Ned Kelly country. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, Omeo is like the high country, yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. See the near the mountains. North of Melbourne. So north, north, yes. north, 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 east, sort of mountainy, sort of. Yes. Anyway, I got some family history, and my grandpa used to do glider flying, flying with Wally. Um, oh. but my grandpa never became a sire, but, but some of his other gliding friends did. They were all into it, I guess, in the old Hazzy Melbourne sort of thing. They were all into it. Um, right. and so it was kind of interesting to find out about Wally and, and, uh, what, what, so what was he, was he wasn't really involved with the PE center that your parents had? No, he was at the Hazzy. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then, it, then he, then he went off to the Sea Org and he, and he captained a ship yeah, he went to St. Hill and then he went to the Sea Org and he remained there until he passed away. Yeah, and what, what did he, um, did he become a captain of the Free Winds as well? No. Oh. No, but he, he was uh, one of the training officers for the Free Winds. No, Mike Napier has always been the captain of the Free Winds. I've never heard of Wally being that, but uh, Wally was one of the main training officers. Well, what, what did Wally do, uh, like, after the Apollo and everything? Um, after the Apollo. Oh, he was the, um, on the Apollo, he was the LRH host. And so when people came to see Hubbard on the ship, like Hubbard's father or Milton Casares, they would, while it was Wally's job to take care of them. And then when we moved ashore, Wally was still doing that. He was in uh, Hubbard's public relations bureau. Okay, and um, where was he? Was he in the California area? No, he was in the Clearwater area. To up until when? In Florida. Up until when? Um, well, I know he went to the ship in probably 87 when we got it. Oh, so he went on the ship? He went to the Free Winds. And then what, and how, and was he on the Free Winds for ever since? Well, or? From what I know, he was there. And then I'd seen some pictures of him in L.A., and I don't know if it was he was no longer ship crew or what, but I'd heard he was doing a project working on Sea Org history. Okay. And so he, did he have blue eyes? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I just, yeah, you know, I just remember this story. Someone told me about meeting some old guy with blue eyes, and they couldn't tell what country he was from, and I thought it was probably an Aussie with mixed with an English accent and they were probably confused as hell. And they were, <laughs> they were, and he said something like, he said something like, yes, you know, one day they're going to, I don't know, something. Anyway, it was, he was one of these old timer sires, old, like that they were describing, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if it was Wally. Right. Um, 
Yeah, interesting. So what happens to someone when they get old in the Sea Org then? Like what do they move on to just more paperwork type posts? You know, yeah, they get part time work and I heard that they're they now have a assisted living type place for some of them. I mean, I don't know. When I was there, they were normally offloaded or put on part-time work, and then gradually they just kind of disappeared and died. Mm. Um, but now apparently apparently, instead of offloading and send them back to family because they've dedicated like 50, 60 years, they have a home for them. Interesting. And, and uh, did uh, apparently in some of these new ideal advanced orgs, uh, they've got a section set up for um, pregnant women to have babies. That's like, I guess, an ideal pregnancy. Um, I don't I've know heard that. about that. Apparently, they're at the new place in uh, in Sydney, they've they've, yeah. they've got that, which is interesting. Well, I feel sorry for the children. Oh, being born into the 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 church and all that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because usually in those nurseries, the worst staff members or the ethics bait is put in charge of that nursery because nobody wants them, you know, around on other jobs. And that's what's left to raise the children. And then the children become neglected. They're like, the priority for the parents is Scientology. Mm. And so the children are second class citizens. Yeah. I mean, I've been there. I I grew up with it myself. So yeah. Yeah, it's kind of awkward, and then and then the kid grows up to like hate Scientology and, and resent it and stuff, and yes, cause, and they get and and what's really silly as well is when the you see the course soups like forcing the kids to do a course, and you're just like, the kid shouldn't be doing the course. It's just the kid, you no, know what I mean? <laughs> you're right, you're right, right. Let them be. Let them be kids. Let them grow up. Yeah, yeah. What about here's a really interesting question. I think this is the the last one I'm going to ask you. Um, what is going on with the churches? Sorry, well, there's a few questions, actually. I was going to say, what's happened to Miscavige's wife, Heba Jench, and what's the CST exactly? And their bases and their special bases and stuff. Yeah, well, I wasn't part of that setup, but, um, yeah, they have them in different locations in order to... Um, Preserve the tech. Preserve the tech so it's always there. So no matter what happens on this planet, the tech is there and available for the new civilization. That's the kind of concept of it. And who who's in CST? Well, the, the Sea Org members are in there. My sister was one of the original trustees, as assigned as a lifetime trustee by Hubbard. But uh, when she left, she didn't know it was lifetime and she was a she was a trustee with Marion Powell and Greg Wilhair. Okay, and but what's this idea that like the real group that's controlling Scientology is in CST? Is that sort of true? No, it's it should be true because um, yeah, Miscavige has taken over control it, of everything. Miscavige is running it, and if those trustees knew that they have the power. Legally and corporately in the United States and California, they could take Miscavige down. But those people don't know the laws of the positions they've been assigned. They're kept ignorant as to how the corporations actually work. And OSA will instead give them, here's your board minutes, just sign these. And they read them and sign them. Some probably don't even read them and they have no idea what it is. It's just some corporate paper to fit the legal requirements to have a company in the U.S., where in actual fact, they have the power to take Miscavige out. But if they knew the rules, they could do that. What about some of these apparent big SP uh, business admin type guys that sort of took over the church secretly in the early 80s, Um, them being in like CST and they're not even sires, they're just like running it and I, d- I don't know anything about that yeah. they're probably just names on paper I, I don't like believe Lyman they have Spurlock any... or something like that I recruited Lyman into the Sea Org uh, okay. he was a long time Scientologist he was a class 6 auditor before he joined the Sea Org in 1977 yeah 
deny, deny. So he, he's, he's not some outsider. He was a dedicated Scientologist. He's since passed away. Okay. And uh, where's Shelley? Is Shelley Miscavige? Where's she? I don't know. I, I did an interview recently with uh, the Daily Mail about Shelley in order to hope that bringing this to the attention that it would help flush her out because no one's really heard from her in 10 years. On the inside, they're saying they know where she is and there's nothing to worry about, but she was a public figure and people are like, where is she? And, and do you think she's in CST? Yeah, I, well, that's what I've heard. I don't know. I would suspect that's probably right. And what about Heber Gensch? Well, Heber was my stepfather. Yeah. And um, from what I've heard from my in little intelligence network, Heber, is he's getting on in years. He's probably about mid-late 80s now. Wow. And um, I heard that he had a stroke. I don't know how true that is. Um, so I heard that he needs help. Uh, so he has someone who's with him full time to assist him with things and to, you know, do his typing for him. And so he's on study from what I've heard. He studies just Scientology training as an auditor and that type of thing because he's not in any sort of physical shape to publicly go out and represent Scientology. Scientology. And but he did go into the hole like 10 years ago or something. That's what I that's what I've been told. Yes. But he's out of it. You know, it. I mean, I, I haven't taught – well, I don't know. Yeah. Because this person assigned with him was assigned to the whole. So I don't know if he's part of that or what. Yeah, I mean, I haven't talked to Heber since the day I left in August 1990. Do you think the whole still exists? To one degree or another, yes. Um, and with your family members, because some of them were also Commodore's messengers, were they? My sister was, and my sister-in-law was. Are they all? Are they still in the church? No, my sister-in-law has passed away, and my sister she left before I did. And with with um, Hubbard's children, is is Diana still in the Sea Org? Diana is still in the Sea Org, and she does public relations for management. Is she the only one? Yes. Wow. Wow. Um. Oh, and last question, right? What's apparently above these bases, they have like a giant symbol or whatever that you can only recognize from the sky, these underground bases to keep the tech in. Um, is it true that they were an alien symbol? Is it true it's a what symbol? It's an alien symbol or something. Uh, probably. Really? Um, a, a lot of the symbols Hubbard came up with, they're all symbols of some sort of recognition from the track, from the whole track. Ah, so if there was some big World War Three, then, you know, from the sky you'd see something and go, what the hell's that? Right, right. Yeah, interesting. I, I remember one, um, oh, you probably... Like, uh, you, do you know Andrew Rinder? He's the brother of Mike Rinder. I, I've never met him, but I know of him. Yeah, because he was so like the same age as you and I think. Uh, yeah. Yep. And um, I remember him mentioning, because uh, he's still in the church and everything. Right. He mentioned something about uh, the bases and the. he just said, you know, he said apparently he asked Miss Cabbage, he said, you know, uh, well, okay, let's say World War Three does happen or whatever, how are we going to know where these bases are? Which is a really good point, which is a really good point if you think about it because it's just like, I think where I am in Australia, if there's if there's a base in Australia, but is there one here, by the way? Um, I don't know. I don't well, think well so. anyway, how are we going to find it? You know what I mean? Like, how am I going to recognize it? And then, and then Ms. Cabbage's re response back was, oh, you'll know, or something. And it's just like, really? Like... Like, you know, shouldn't, he be, shouldn't he be telling? Shouldn't he be telling us, or or the symbols that we might recognise, or we'll just see? Or... Yeah, they're, they're symbols that'll show you, the lead lead you the way. Wow, it's so interesting yeah, interviewing a different person as opposed to was interviewing John Burke, Jonathan Burke. Uh, he's an indie auditor, and he can he can really talk. 
Like he just, right. whoa, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's interesting interviewing people uh, who aren't as talkative, like as much as him, you know? So it's just, it's just different. It's totally, it's totally, that's why I'm a bit stunted during this interview because I'm used to, I've done a bunch of interviews recently with two people, Scott Gordon and, and Jonathan Burke, who, who yeah. really, you know, they really talk a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I, I was kind of just wanting to answer your questions. Yeah, no, no, no. It's good. It's actually, it's actually better to be honest because they, they, um, they say so much and you just get blown away like going, ah, like there's so much to ask them or whatever or, and they just, they go on. But anyway, oh, okay. anyway, okay. Um, that, that, that's it. I think I've asked you all I want to ask you. Um, okay. Except uh, w- all right, one last question, all right? All right. What do you think of this idea of Captain Bill being in communication with LIH telepathically in the 80s? Uh, you know, it's possible. Um, you know, I wasn't involved in whatever communication they had. So if Captain Bill feels he was, then who am I to say he wasn't? Okay. Yeah, I think I agree. And um, if you said that, it's, uh, that LH was losing his marbles in the 80s, how could someone then write a book that logically makes sense and, and write a book? You know, like a massive one like Mission Earth, if you're losing well, your that marbles. Was, that was before. So you so you think that he wrote when do you think he wrote Mission Earth? Well, he wrote that what in the early eighties, early to mid eighties. That was that was probably like seventy three when he wrote seventy two seventy three. Mission no no Mission Earth. Yeah. This the, you, you, so you he think he wrote Battlefield Earth and then he did Mission Earth. Yeah. Um. But Mission Earth, but Battlefield Earth didn't get released until eighty two. Okay, and when did Mission Earth get re- released? I think that was around 85. It was much later. Okay, so he probably wrote in 84. 83, 84, yeah, that's what I'm, I Yeah, and that, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I, like, that's what really throws a spanner in the works for me in that how can someone write a book if they're, they're having strokes and losing their marbles? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but one can write a book and then that type of thing can happen. I yes. think that's more of the sequence. So you reckon he finished the big saga and then started to lose his marbles after that? Right. Yeah. And, and what? Well, when do you think he started to lose the marbles? What sort of date? Uh, you know, I couldn't nail it down for you. You know, I, I just know that some of the traffic that was coming down from him, I'm – I got concerned about it because, but I was more of thinking what was being sent to him for yeah. him to be responding that way. So maybe he wasn't, wasn't losing his marbles then. Maybe not. But the responses he was giving showed that he was in fear of external influences and internal influences getting in the way of Scientology. Do you think he knew that the church had possibly possibly been taken over by the government? No, no. And what makes you say that? Because he felt that the mission holders were what was trying to take it over until Miscavige and those and that whole thing was done. Um, no, that there's no reason that the government would want to come in and take over running some big corporation that they disagree with in the first place and if they were running it why weren't they paying the taxes yeah yeah (laughs) interesting huh all right thanks for talking to me janice okay that was a good interview so where if someone wants to get the book where can they get it from uh in australia they can get it from uh vivid publications and uh, or Amazon.com. Okay. So you just go he, Amazon. He, yeah. Here's the book. Look at that. Yeah, that's good. Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, so you can just, can when you buy it at Amazon, do you get an electronic form of it? You can get it electronic or you can get paperback. And that's why I set it up with um, Vivid Publications in Australia so that they didn't have to pay for the international shipping. All right, and um, I will send. I'll send you the link. 
for yes. the Australian publication. Good. I'll put it in the um, in the comment section. Uh, okay. And uh, if somebody, I was going to say, if, some, if if you do release the audio books in the future, that would be at Amazon or something, I guess. Would it? Yeah, that'll be. I guess so. Uh, it'll be through whoever the audio company is doing it, but it will go out on Amazon as well. Are you going to speak in it? That would be cool, I reckon. No, no. I'd, I'd offered to do it, and they're like, do you really want to do 484 pages? That's a long time and a lot of speaking, especially if you're not trained for it. They said yeah. they've had authors do it before, and they just give up after three days. Wow. Yeah, so I said, well, maybe I'll just do the introduction or something. Yes, do that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the interview. Okay. All Thanks, right. Andy. See you later. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, so that was it. I hoped you liked the interview. I liked it. I was a little bit not quite right during that interview, to be honest. I think I was a little bit uh, not prepared, actually. And also, it is quite a, it was a bit different. Um, Janice was a lot different to the other people I'd interviewed recently. So, I don't know, it's sort of hard to adjust to that. Anyway, it's now time for us to end off with a quote by L. Ron Hubbard. And it's the Code of Honor. Number one, never desert a comrade in need, in danger or in trouble. Number two, never withdraw allegiance once granted. Number three, never desert a group to which you owe your support. Number four, never disparage yourself or minimize your strength or power. Number five, never need praise, approval, or sympathy. Number six, Never compromise with your own reality. Number seven, never permit your affinity to be alloyed. Number eight, do not give or receive communication unless you yourself desire it. Number nine, your self-determinism and your honor are more important than your immediate life. Number ten, your integrity to yourself is more important than your body. Number 11. Never regret yesterday. Life is in you today and you make your tomorrow. Number 12. Never fear to hurt another in a just cause. Number 13. Don't desire to be liked or admired. And number 14. Be your own advisor. Keep your own counsel and select your own decisions. And number 15. Be true to your own goals. Wow. I know I went over them quickly there, but each one is quite deep. And uh, I could elaborate on each point. That was a Scientology code of honor. It's very important. I kind of almost feel like that's like Scientology's version of the Ten Commandments. Really, I mean, I think, I don't know, but it's just, it. to me, it makes a strong person, a person who's strong, who thinks for themselves and stands up for themselves and um, supports good causes. I really, um, I really like it. And uh, I think you can st- use it when you're stuck uh, in tough times and you probably got into tough times in the first place because you weren't abiding by this code of honor. Uh, a lot of people who had some bad experiences with the church because the church is corrupted. Um, part of the reason why they had a bad experience with the church was because they violated this code of honor. They didn't hold it. Some people actually naturally hold this code of honor, uh, without even having to really read this uh they naturally um live a life like that but other people you know they very easily if for example permit their affinity to be alloyed and they very easily compromise with their own reality um 
I think this is really important. I think this is, I guess, partially why um, L. Ron Hubbard, Ron Hubbard was so attacked during his life because he was making people that were not sheeps. He was making strong people who stood up for themselves and who thought for themselves. You know, and people in power do not like that. They want to teach people that their own reality is wrong and that their reality is right. That's how sick in the head that some evil SPs are who run this world. Um, but yeah, they don't like they don't like Scientology. It absolutely creates people who are just are unique and think for themselves and don't give a shit what other people say. I'm just trying to find here what my, which one is my favorite out of all these ones. But I think. Uh, I like this one. Your self determinism and your honor are more important than your imme- than your immediate life. Your self determinism and your honor are more important than your immediate life. It's kind of yeah. It's just because I mean you have to break down each one and look up words and stuff, and you have to study this kind of honor because it's so deep and think about it. But that to me means that you doing what you you want to do is more important than, like, your immediate life, like the things that are just close to you, like your your the job you might be working at the moment or close friends, your immediate life, the close personal stuff. It's just like, no, screw that shit. That's not important. What's important is that you are doing what you want. Because a lot of people, I imagine, as they're living sort of trapped, scared, worried about their immediate life and what people will think of them and, oh, I can't do this because of that. No, I can't do that because of this. And, oh, you know, yeah, I want to do that, but no, I can't do blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, no, your self-determinism is most important. You have to do what you want. Otherwise, you're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to enjoy anything and you're just going to be a slave. So it's your self-determinism. You determine what you want to do. You think for yourself. And don't care about your immediate life. It's not that important. Okay? Yes. Like, say, for example, um, you're working uh, for a company that sells alcohol. And you don't want to do that. So, so you you think that, oh, you know, my it's going to ruin my immediate life and damage it. And it's just like, uh, yes. Okay, it might. You leaving that job might in the short term, cause a little bit of problems. But in the long term, you doing what you want to do and actually living your life is much, much better for you. You know what I mean? And in the, in, it's going to help you much more in the long run. So it's your self-determinism, doing what you want to do and your honor, you know. Standing up and walking tall and having pride is more important than your immediate life. You know, this little crap that's all around, it's not that important. It's good. This one I think is very good as well. Never regret yesterday. Life is in you today and you make your tomorrow. I think that's a really good point. I definitely could see how L. Ron Hubbard lived that way. I mean, he just didn't give a shit about yesterday. He would just be like, whatever, and he'll just get on with doing his things. And I know there's a lot of people who are low tone and a lot of Scientology haters is they're stuck in the past and they always regret over yesterday and they they dwell on it and they're like, no, you can't do this because of blah, blah, blah. No, you can't do this because of blah, blah, blah. You can't do this. Oh, can you believe Aaron Hubbard did this? Blah, 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 blah. And I think they find Aaron Hubbard an odd character and they can't understand him as a person because they can't understand this idea of just ignoring what happened yesterday and just living each life like it's a new day. And getting on with it. Because a lot of them, they would be like, if something stuffs up or something, like they really, it really affects them and hits them. And they're like, oh, and they think they have to, like, I can't do that ever again. Or blah, blah, blah. it really affects them. And Hubbard was the sort of guy that was just like, yeah, do this and do that. And, and next day, do this and just ignore whatever happened. Like, if, yeah, if yesterday had a stuff up, whatever, just continue, you know, don't let it change the way you are and start making and make your tomorrow. So this is a really good point. Never regret yesterday. Life is in you today and you make your tomorrow. 
the I mean they don't they don't teach these things at school, but I mean these these are really good bits of advice. You need to look at a kid in the face. You need to grab him. Well, I feel like I I wanted. I feel like if I was at school, I'd want a teacher to do this to me and do it to every student in the class. Grab them by the collar and stare them in the eyes and say, you make your tomorrow. You know, there's something really important and powerful about that. You know, you don't, you don't get this idea spread this, that much in this society we live in, this corrupted society. They don't tell you, you make your tomorrow. It's a real serious thing you need to tell people. You make your tomorrow. You can do something about your problems or whatever. You make your tomorrow. If you've got a problem now, that's because of something you did in the past. You know what I mean? Accept responsibility. You make your tomorrow. Like, a lot of people try and pass off things as being, oh, that was a coincidence or an accident or fate or, you know, oh, oh, I, you know, like, this just, I was affected and this just happened. And, and, and they, they stop taking responsibility for themselves. They, they play this victim thing, like, oh, I was a victim. And, oh, I was a victim. It's just like you were making yourself into a victim. You had something to do with that, you know? It's just, it's just the traits of people who are below tone two on the scale. And uh, these are sort of traits that uptone people adopt. You make your tomorrow. It's very important. It's very simple. But in this mess, this confusion with false data everywhere, like... You just don't get these good bits of advice and people grow up just confused and not really knowing what to do, you know? It's crazy. I like this one as well. Never fear to hurt another in a just cause. So, sometimes things are, you need to do them, you know, like the, the snake is biting the baby and you have to just kill the snake, you know? Or hurt another, you might need to, maybe say something that hurts someone's feeling or something, but it's a just cause, you know, like never fear to hurt another. Like, don't be scared of, like, for example, there could be someone who could be smashing all these drugs, for example, you know, and someone who's low toned and all fearful and scared will be like, Oh, I don't want to say anything bad about his lifestyle because like it might hurt his feelings. And it's just like, don't worry about her feelings, you know, say it to him you know let him know you shouldn't be smoking all his ice or something like that you know i don't know these are just really good points and i like this one as well don't desire to be liked or admired that's very important because a lot of people walking around desperate to be liked and admired and you just end up getting into a trap because you end up having to do things that other people um, approve of like for example let's say it's popular to wear Nike shoes the next minute you're wearing Nike shoes and you're like oh they like me because they like my Nike shoes you know what I mean and you're like you're in this this trap of of other people determining what you're doing and it's just like no just do what you want to do and don't give a shit about what other people say you know and and that, that that's something that's in that's popular I've noticed these days is that there's a lot of people who are desiring to be liked and admired and they're in this habit of you know anyway that's it for the podcast hope you like that code of honor it's time for you to climb back out of this rabbit hole out of this interesting Scientology world if you have any good Scientology Facebook posts or jokes then send them to Andy Nolch at hotmail.com. Thanks for listening. I've been your host, Andy Nolch, the Space Cowboy. You have been listening to the Indie Scientology podcast. And until next time, keep evolving and get up that bridge.